Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Welcome to our last scientific session of the day. Uh, my name is Jesse Shapiro. I'm an associate prof at McGill University in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology uh, here at the McGill Genome Center. Um, and it's uh, my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, two fantastic speakers for this last session, uh, Dr. Charles Rutini and Dr. Christian Anderson. Uh, so uh, Dr. Rutini will talk first, followed by, by uh, Dr. Anderson. And uh, this session is going to take us from uh, the response to COVID in Africa to uh, the viral side of things, um, origins of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So um, a very diverse session um, that I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about. Uh, so uh, Charles Rotimi is a genetic epidemiologist and an NIH distinguished investigator. Um, he is a leader in exploring implications of increased genetic diversity in African ancestry populations for disease mapping and is especially proud of his efforts in globalizing genomics. And, and when I say genomics, this is mainly uh, human genomics. Uh, he's the founding president of the thriving African Society of Human Genetics, uh, as a member of the United States National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the African Academy of Sciences, and is the 2020 president-elect for the American Society of Human Genetics. So it's our pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Routini, and um, I will hand it over to, to him. Oh, and so before I do that, sorry, I'll say, uh, uh, you probably all know, but uh, questions in the chat, um, and I'll, I'll curate the, the questions. Each talk will be about 25 minutes with about 10 minutes for questions. So um, without further ado, Professor Rotini. Yeah, thanks, Jesse, for that wonderful introduction. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Again, I'm going to attempt to uh, summarize what my understanding is of Africa response to COVID. Of course, I live in the United States, so I borrowed generously, uh, you know, from my friends and also, um, you know, just reading and following about what is going on with COVID. Um, hopefully I can advance my slide. I was able to do it earlier, um, see. Okay, here we go. I think, yes, fantastic. So the most of the information that I have and I want to share with you really comes from where I think most of the response have been centralized. And that's within the, um, in the African Union, specifically um, African, uh, you know, CDC. Uh, they have basically developed platforms and a way to update uh, COVID uh, in the pandemic. Uh, on a daily basis, and also to help coordinate uh, the response uh, in terms of uh, equipment, in terms of uh, public health strategy, and also in terms of uh, raising funds. And um, um, as just as important is really how to coordinate the procurement of, of the various uh, needed uh, you know, supply efforts. So, Again, just to remind us, I think we are all perhaps familiar with the statistics, a uh, case fatality rate of about 2% globally. And uh, in Africa, it's about 2.6. So it's a little more deadly, which one probably would um, have you know, suspected, uh, you know, given the fact that uh, the healthcare infrastructure is, will be you know, seriously challenged by a pandemic like this. But again, just to take us back a little bit, the first uh, confirmed case was in Egypt in February last year. And then uh, subsequently after that, about a couple of weeks after that, there was a confirmed case in Nigeria, in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, from a visitor, an uh, Italian citizen. Um, and then subsequently uh, we had multiple uh, you know, infections uh, you know, across the, um, you know, the country especially started areas where there were quite a bit of travel, uh, international traveling. Um, I joke with my friends sometimes that COVID started, you know, among the, the elite, um, you know, in, in, uh, in Nigeria. Again, that's because of, again, the travel history um, where people were interacting. Uh, you know, 
as of uh, November 16, it's a little over 8.5 million cases. Again, these numbers I would seriously encourage you to take with a grain of salt because of lack of comprehensive testing. Uh, the, the mortality rate may be a little bit closer to being accurate in the sense that people when you know, die and they tend to be recorded. Um, and um, about 80 million tests have been performed and a positivity rate of about 1%. So one of the things, uh, difficulty about addressing Africa is, is made up of multiple countries, huge diversity uh, in terms of response, uh, um, in government, uh, you know, policies. And this. So I just here give you an example of some of the extreme numbers. I uh, just to give you a flavor of the fact that we are dealing with a whole continent, not a country. Um, you know, so it, it, starting with the vaccines that are currently available and being used, um, again, if you look at Egypt, uh, you do see that um, in terms of vaccination, uh, it's about 47% of the supplies that they have received out of about 65 million or 66 million approximately. And that's about a completion rate of about 11%. Um, you know, uh, in Egypt. Uh, similar numbers in South Africa is about 22% of uh, vaccination. Uh, so South Africa is doing much, uh, much better. Um, and in Nigeria, uh, you can see that the vaccination rate is extremely low. It's, it's still around one point, you know, less than 2%. And, um, and in, uh, in charge, it's even worse. Uh, so this just gives you a flavor of the fact that the response and the impact of COVID it varies tremendously uh, across the uh, across the continent. Now, most of the response in terms of using genomic technology has come from a coordinated effort from the Institute of Pathogen uh, Genomics, uh, which has in this sequence uh, close to fifty four. Uh, thousand, um, you know, uh, COVID, uh, you know, provided COVID sequences, you know. So this has been tremendously helpful. But the point I want to make here is that a lot of this could not have happened without the initial investment in sequencing technology that came through organizations and effort like H3 Africa, and also the World Bank funding uh, centers of ex excellence and you know, across the country. So. The point here is really that we don't need to wait for disasters to happen before we think about necessary infrastructure, especially across African you know, countries where there is really no good national policies uh, to, to address a uh, you know, pandemic like this uh, and uh, in biomedical research in general. So having an institute, uh, the Pathogen Institute has been tremendously helpful um, but it, we can do much better. Um, and I think there needs to be a more co coordinated effort at the national and continental level. So in terms of public health benefit from these pathogens, uh, part of the thing that we have to do always is to justify uh, why we need genomic technology. Um, when we were setting up Asia for uh, H3 Africa, for example, um, you know, I constantly was being asked, do you think Africa needs genomics? Um, you know, when people still don't have, you know, adequate drinking water. And I always, you know, my answer is always, do not underestimate the impact of new technology and how that can indeed drive public health strategy. And that's precisely what has happened uh, with genomics in the context of disease surveillance um, you know, on time, you know, understanding of how diseases, how pathogens are spreading, uh, including deadly pathogens like Ebola. The 2014 Ebola pandemic, for example, was really helped to, was curtailed because of the availability of sequencing strategy that was, you know, helping us to monitor it across West Africa. So, and that has translated now in terms of COVID. Uh, so, the, again, the emphasis here is that we need to think about the necessary technology we need to put in place 
uh, so that we can be um, ad we can adequately provide response uh, for the next uh, you know pandemic epidemic because we know it's going to happen. So the core components of the uh, African um, you know uh, pathogen uh, initiative uh, really is to create um, you know and build a continental-wide functional and operational network of pathogens, genomics, and bioinformatics. I cannot overemphasize the need for bioinformatics. A lot of the sequences that have been done are being interpreted locally across African countries. And again, that's as a result of investment in bioinformatics. Um, you can really not do genomics if you don't have adequate bioinformatics structure. And H3 Africa, again, has helped us to establish very good informatics, uh, what we call the uh, H3 Africa BioNet, uh, which is located in uh, you know, Cape Town, but with nodes now in about 30 African countries. So the Next Generation Sequencing Academy uh, is also part of this initiative. Uh, again, developing key partnership and engaging genomic sequences, uh, again, working with you know, companies like Illumina, different African investigators and countries uh, to establish a, an academy where young men and women are being trained uh, to lead the next frontier uh, in how to use genomics to understand you know, um, uh, public health, pathogen sequencing, and, and um, you know, just, again, address uh, you know, public health strategy in general. So the part of the response also, again, this is pretty interesting, is that the um, uh, African Union set up a process where individuals can actually donate and also corporations uh, as long as it's consistent uh, with the objectives uh, uh, you know, of, the, of the union. So to me, this was actually quite um, um, an interesting way of responding uh, you know, to pandemic because of limited resources that is actually available in some countries. So this was a major effort to try to uh, you know, get funds and then to distribute that resource. Okay. The other issue is this is absolutely not trivial, is the supply of necessary equipment and preventive, you know, up to things like masks. Making that centrally available reduces cost and also help to, uh, in terms of distributions. So again, I think the lessons learned here is that African nations need to think ahead of time in terms of how to create inventories of critical supply materials and not waiting for things to happen before you start you know, gearing up your, uh, your, your public health strategies. And this is critical. The development and production of necessary supplies across African countries, this has happened to some extent, but is really, really limited. And we need to do better. One of the things that COVID has shown to African countries and the global community in general is the huge disparity in terms of access to medical equipment, medical supplies, and you know, training. And so we need to look at this from a global perspective and to see how we can make things better. Now, COVAX is, to me, is one of the really critical um, efforts, you know, global efforts. Uh, because it's, it's true that no one is safe until everyone is safe. And what COVID did and showed to us is that we are indeed a global community. You cannot pull ring around your nations. You're just one plane uh, flight away to bring the disease to your border. Uh, therefore, the approach needs to be global and, and it needs to be equitable. The way global vaccines have gone shows to the world that the rich gets richer and the poor gets poorer. And to me, the challenge is, is to African nations to stop relying so much on external funding of research and infrastructure and to begin to develop policies that will help African nations to better prepare and, and, and start to produce vaccines. 
And there are some examples now uh, where African leaders are responding and recognizing the fact that the, the response has been really challenging because the vaccines are not produced locally. And so there is some efforts now to try to do that. Uh, there's an uh, initiative in Senegal, uh, in Rwanda, and uh, in Egypt, and in South Africa. So these are all efforts that will help if there is a subsequent pandemic, um, and also will help in this current one uh, to increase vaccine production and distribution. You know, so thank you very much. That's the point, you know, what I, really, I wanted to, uh, to share with the audience. All right, uh, excellent. Thank you, uh, Professor Otimi. Um, we have uh, lots of time for, for questions. Um, thank you for the uh, very succinct talk. Um, so feel free to put some, some questions in the, in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I'll, I'll start with, um, with one question. Um, so you talked a lot about vaccines, um, but there's, there's now um, a lot of excitement now about uh, antiviral treatment. So protease inhibitors and um, uh, um, uh, um, mutagenic meltdown um, drugs as well. Um, are, are those... Um, Going to be coming online in in Africa is is there uh, in in terms of costs um, has has that been discussed or do you have perspectives on deployment of of, of these antiviral drugs? Uh, those really have not. There's no coordinated effort currently, uh, you know, for those. And again, given the current cost structure, I really don't see that happening anytime soon unless there is some really um, you know, major effort from maybe things like the Gates Foundation or the World Bank uh, to actually work with these uh, pharmaceutical companies that hold the patents, you know, to this drug to actually work with them to reduce costs uh, in a way that it can indeed uh, be accessible to, um, to, to countries that are resource challenged. Uh, you know, so to me, um, I think this is what actually makes it even more painful to, our, to people in developing countries. And that is, you hear about this advancement, um, you know, and, but you just hear about it and it's not having impact in the environment that you live in because mostly because of distribution challenges and costs and nations not having policies, you know, that will help to negotiate uh, some of these cost structures. You know, so to me, that is really what I think COVID is showing to all of us, you know, that we need to see ourselves as a global community and put in place strategies that we create equitable assets as we develop, you know, drugs, especially for pandemics that nobody is safe until everybody is safe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, we have our, our first question in the chat. Uh, this is from... Jerome Nriagu, uh, Nriagu um, who asks, do you know of any phenotypes that predispose or protect Africans from COVID-19? So I, I, I'm not sure if the question is, is, well, maybe I'll add to the question, phenotypes or genotypes, um, but uh, protective or predisposition factors in Africans. That is such an excellent question because it's something that I have been grappling with personally. You know, as a genomic person, um, I'm trying to understand because one of the things that have actually happened, um, which we don't know why, is that the impact of COVID that we were all sort of anticipating across Africa uh, in a negative way is really that it was going to be very devastating, you know, uh, more than what we see in North America and things like that. And, but that hasn't really happened except maybe in South Africa, you know? So which raises the question, why? Uh, and um, the virus is there, it's mutating, um, but the impact has not, you know, thankfully has not been as great as what I was really afraid of, 
when the pandemic started. There have been some speculations um, that maybe because Africa population is so young, uh, that even when there was some infections and it know that the young population recovered more quickly and therefore it wasn't as devastating. Um, and there's some speculation that because African populations for the most part are actually heavily vaccinated uh, against all sorts of you know, um, uh, infectious agents uh, that that may have created some reservoir of resistance you know, to, 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 um, you know, to COVID. Uh, but again, those are all speculations. Um, and I know we have not really systematically looked at the genetic variation in the context of COVID to be able to actually pinpoint whether there are some um, protective uh, variants uh, or even susceptibility variants, uh, you know, in the African genomes, uh, you know, to, to that may help begin to explain some of this. But the other thing also is that African population is constantly challenged on a daily basis by pathogens. When I was growing up in Nigeria, you know, I know I used to, you know, get malaria like twice a year. You, know, you get all sorts of infectious diseases. So you are constantly challenged. So you build some immunity. I don't know whether that is protective in this context of COVID or not, but those are things that epidemiologists and uh, social scientists need to study with time and give us insights, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think a lot of uh, exciting opportunities um, for, for research into you know, both environmental and, and genetic factors, risk factors. Uh, any other questions? Um, feel free to put them in the in the chat. Um, got one more before we uh, move on. Um, so this is from uh, I'm not sure who uh, anonymous question. Um, oh, sorry, from uh, from Mark. Uh, from Mark Lathrop. Uh, great overview. Uh, beyond COVID, could you discuss new human sequencing and other medical genetic efforts in Africa and how they will be structured? Uh, yes. Uh, again, th there are several, you know, startup companies now and also the work that we are doing with H3 Africa. Uh, where we have now enrolled uh, over 100,000 individuals across, you know, as mostly across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And quite a bit of those individuals are undergoing genotyping and sequencing efforts, um, you know, based on the various diseases that investigators are doing. And um, there is also a, a, a new company now, you know, 54Gene, that is also enrolling and, you know, creating opportunities. Um, you know, so I, I do believe that the sequencing across Africa by African scientists is on the increase. And some of the sequencing efforts that we have done uh, in terms of human sequencing uh, have indeed uh, also gone to public databases. Uh, for example, um, we have uh, now, I think, just a little under 500, um, you know, uh, whole genome sequences that we just put in uh, EGA. Uh, you know, for from different African populations uh, to use, uh, you know, to create a global good that everybody can use to understand um, you know, the human genetic variations you know, across the world. Uh, so there are other efforts just going on across different African countries. Um, and um, in the Wellcome Trust um, and the NIH and, you know, the Gates Foundation and the, um, uh, the World Bank are indeed creating opportunities now for us to do more sequencing, uh, you know, locally. So it's, it's just going to increase. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll ask one more question uh, and uh, while waiting to see if there's any more in the chat. Um, so Anecdotally, you know, I, I, I've heard about vaccine hesitancy in, in Africa as well. And you showed a slide showing, you know, quite contrasting vaccination rates relative to vaccine supplies in, in different countries. Um, and I, I wonder if you could comment on, you know, different, if at 
that that being different across African countries and, and you know, certainly um, in North America and Europe, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a, a particular uh, challenge and, and concern. So I wonder if um, there have been studies or if you could comment on uh, vaccine hesitancy challenges in Africa. Uh Yes, my understanding uh, again is um, that right now we really don't have that problem. <laughs> um, we the, the the number of vaccines available are so limited that the the issue is really how quickly can you get them into arms, um, you know, rather than the you know hesitance. So. I'm sure, just like everywhere else, uh, you are going to find individuals who may have, who may be reluctant. But I will tell you that the history of vaccination in Africa is extremely good, um, and that is most of all, or just about all of us. We know. Uh, I told you how I was, you know, getting different infection when I was growing up in Nigeria. Uh, we know that the the uh, healthcare infrastructure is not very robust. Therefore, you need primary prevention uh, for most of these diseases. So you don't need to really do too much hard work to convince an African that a vaccine is probably the best cause of, um, that they're going to have in terms of survival uh, and not to rely on uh, inadequate healthcare infrastructure. So the, the rate of hesitancy, you know, I, I believe if it's really systematically studied, uh, is going to be extremely low uh, compared to what we get in places like North America in the U.S., for example. Yeah. All right. I'm glad to hear that. I, I, I've heard anecdotal uh, uh, remarks about that. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, you don't think it's a, a very widespread issue. And uh, again, given the the access to the internet now, just like you know, Americans, Canadians, and we are all sort of getting this, you know, creating this feedback loop, a uh, loop of bad information, and you know, so Africans are not immune to that. And I just hope that that doesn't begin to impact the very wonderful history of vaccination across the continent. Great. Well, th that's a, a pretty positive note to, to end on. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, so I think uh, we will wrap up there well on time um, and move over to... Oh, wait, one last question. Okay, all right. Okay. We've got time. We've got time. One, okay. one last question. Um, yeah, we're, we're still well on time, I believe. Um, again, from Jerome Riagu, who asks, can you think of any genetic angle to the fact that Black Americans seem to be more susceptible to COVID-19? Um, I, I would really caution that question. Um, and, and the reason is, I believe very strongly, while we have increased uh, infection and also mortality in minority populations in the US, including African Americans, may not necessarily be due to genetics at all. Uh, it is perhaps uh, more strongly related to the inequity that exists in the society. And what COVID did was to pour gasoline on that inequity and make it so apparent to all of us. We call people essential workers and we pay the minimum wage. And they are the ones that are first exposed you know, to this to these uh, you know, pathogens and infectious agents. They are also the one that goes to neighborhoods that doesn't have adequate protections. Uh, and, um, you know, so before we go to genetics, I think we really have to carefully understand all the social structures that society has put in place that disadvantage some people uh, in terms of their health. And I think to me, that will explain over 90% of the disparity that we see in terms of uh, the uh, COVID infections and also death uh, from a um, minority. And also those poor social structures have indeed put people at much higher risk for things like diabetes, hypertension, obesity, that we know also makes COVID worse. Uh, you know, so if those populations are already suffering 
from these comorbidities are at a much higher frequency, you can imagine how that will just drive COVID mortality uh, you know, in these communities. So I would really caution us um, you know, to not jump to genetics uh, yet. There might be, but I don't know. But if even there is genetics, I can assure you, it will not come close to explaining the disparity as social environment will. Absolutely, thank you. And uh, Jerome says thank you as well. And we see the same thing in Canada as well, um, you know, by mapping neighborhoods, uh, COVID cases really map um, with, with income, with housing density, all these uh, social and racialized factors as opposed to genetics. Um, so yeah, I thank you, thank you for the answer. Thank you. All right, with that, we will move on. So let's uh, I, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rotini, once again, uh, for a great talk and great discussion. Um, next, uh, to wrap up, in fact, the, um, the whole day, um, we have uh, my friend, uh, Professor Christian Anderson, who's joining us from the Scripps Research Institute in uh, San Diego. Uh, Christian and I worked together uh, for a couple of years as, as postdocs at, at the Broad Institute, uh, studying Lassa virus evolution. And um, Christian has gone on to found the Viral Hemorrhagic Fever Consortium, uh, putting together fantastic resources uh, for coronavirus and other viruses, um, like outbreak.info, um, a lot of great resources that, that many of us um, use routinely today. Um, Christian has studied coronavirus, Zika, Ebola, West Nile, the list goes on. Um, Christian's actually an immunologist uh, deep down uh, who uh, did his PhD in immunology at Cambridge before moving into virus genomics uh, at Harvard and the Broad Institute, and then starting his own lab um, in, in San Diego, uh, where he's gone on to really exciting things. Uh, so uh, going from consequences of COVID in Africa, we're, we're gonna end the day by going back to the beginning, uh, and uh, Christian is going to talk to us about the origins of SARS-CoV-2. With that, Great. I'll pass it over to Christian. Great. Thank you, uh, Professor Shapiro. That's, that's just weird. Uh, yes, as Jesse mentioned, uh, Jesse and I used to do our postdoc together not that long ago, um, back at the, the Broad Institute in Harvard. And some of the work that I'm going to present today actually builds on, on that work that we did together back then, which was pivoting from, as Jesse mentioned, my immunology background into something much more exciting, which has to do with viral evolution, emergence of, of, of infectious diseases. So I want to talk to you today. First, I'd actually planned on, on giving an overview of some of the other work we were doing. But given the recent interest in this particular question about the origin of this, this virus and the pandemic, I thought I wanted to spend time on that. And I think many, one of the main reasons for doing that is that a lot of the conversation today really is plagued by speculation, conspiracy theories, and, and politicized uh, agenda, which I think is very unfortunate because, of course, the scientist, it's important that we stick to the evidence. And the evidence, there's much more of that than I think most people realize. So I'll lay that out, um, out today. So how did this all actually start? Well, I got interested in this question uh, back in January 2020, and you've probably seen my email to Tony Fauci here uh, at the end of January, where I was quite concerned about what I had just observed, or what we had observed, where I even talked about some of the features potentially look engineered. I say that it's inconsistent with expectations from evolutionary biology. That all sounds pretty bad. And it was simply because that we had had some conversations and discussions and early analyses that we actually thought that this could very well have been a, in a lab leak, especially knowing the kind of research going on in Wuhan. I will point out, though, that I also said, and this seemed to be forgotten by many, but we have to take a much closer look at this and there's still further analyses to be done so those opinions could still change. And of course, if you have followed some of my research, you would know that they did in fact change. And no, they did not change because I'm in cahoots with the CCP and Tony Fauci and God knows who else. It actually changed because of scientific evidence, which continues to this day. So if we're looking at the main hypotheses here, I'll say we have two main hypotheses. There are other hypotheses too, but these are the two main ones that have, have, have sort of reached into the, to the public sphere here. One is the lab leak, of which there are many sub-hypotheses on, 
ranging from the bioweapon idea, where this was a bioweapon that was designed and released, uh, which has been largely dismissed, although not completely, the chimeric virus, uh, where you have SARS-CoV-2 actually be a mosaic of different viruses that then created SARS-CoV-2. There's the culture version of this via via gain of function, where you're trying to create something more transmissible, a more infectious natural virus, where it sort of just popped out of a Petri dish. Sampling a batch for research purposes, which I should point out is a zoonosis or so contaminated sample brought to the lab, which is also zoonosis. Now, what's really important here is that there's no evidence for any of this. For the people that are involved that have actually tried some of this work knows that, for example, culturing a, a virus out of any bat sample is not easy. It's not just something that happens easily, but most importantly, by far, is that a lab leak itself cannot explain the emergence of SARS-CoV-2, right? It's just a part of that. Of course, in order to leak from a lab, it needs to be in a lab. And that's really where the evidence base completely breaks down. I will go into this a little bit more detail later on. Of course, the other theory, the one we have seen that a hypothesis, a theory here that we have seen multiple times happening before is natural emergence. So simply this was a, you know, standard vanilla zoonotic spillover associated with a wildlife market, which we have seen uh, previously happen. Before I go into this, I want to point out that there's a lot of confusion around what is it that we're trying to say here. I'm not arguing that something is not possible. When we're talking about everything I just showed you, any version of that is possible. What I'm talking about is plausibility. Just because two things are possible, it doesn't mean that they're equally likely. And it's really important to understand that that is a very, very you know, specific and very, very important distinction. I'm not saying that a lab leak is possible. I do not say that we have ruled it out or that we have proven that it is not possible. What I'm talking about is plausibility. And to understand plausibility, you of course need pre-existing evidence. What do you know about viruses in general? How do they emerge? And then importantly, you need to look at the actual evidence, which is right in front of you. So the things about SARS-CoV-2 that makes SARS-2 not SARS-1, and these are some of the early features that we identified, and they have to do with two primary things. The first one is the polybasic cleavage, cleavage site, or the, the furin cleavage site, which is the insertion of the S1, S2 subunit of the spike protein of SARS-2, of this PRAR, and that particular AAR, AR, serves as a furin cleavage site. It can be cleaved by the host enzyme furin. It is a suboptimal site, and as I'll show you in a little bit, it's actually also out of frame. But that's probably one of the main features of SARS-2 that makes it SARS-2 and not SARS-1. And we have not seen a furin cleavage site like this previously in subechoviruses or SARS-like coronaviruses. Second to that is the receptor binding domain, which is probably the part that actually spooked me the one most in the very beginning, where you have contact residues we knew from SARS-1 research that were important for ACE2 binding. And what was unique about SARS-2 was that it had a receptor binding domain that we had never seen before, with these particular positions being different. And importantly, despite that, it actually looked to be a good human ACE2 binder which was quite mysterious. The being good at binding is based on homology studies and structural modeling that we did early on. But here's the thing. Well, time goes by and turns out that actually this mysterious receptor binding domain is not mysterious, nor is it actually unique to SARS-2. We see it in other coronaviruses. When we wrote our first paper, The Proximal Origin of SARS-CoV-2, back in 2020, is that that had been identified in coronaviruses from pangolins. So what that tells you is that this feature is not something that's unique to this virus. In fact, it is out in nature because we have seen it in pangolin coronaviruses. Since then, we have seen it in bat coronaviruses as well, specifically in the banal viruses, uh, quite recently identified in Laos. Have exactly the same, or not exactly the same, but all these uh, contact contact residue and the vast majority of the receptor binding are identical between these viruses and SARS-2. So there's nothing unique about that. And in fact, they actually get to appear to be pretty common. The same can be said about the furin cleavage site. If you look down here, you can see this is just a, how it is actually inserted into SARS-2. And it is out of frame compared to other um, coronaviruses. It's also suboptimal. 
which means it is not really the kind of fear inside you would expect to see in a virus if you were to design it, for example. And in fact, we have seen significant evolution, especially as proline up here in the variants of concerns like alpha and beta, where it changes to either an R or an H, creating a better fear and cleavage site. What's important too is that this particular part of the viral genome, here we're looking at the better coronaviruses, and there are many others that have fear and cleavage site like Mabecos and Embecos. Um, what you can see here is this is actually an extremely evolvable region of the viral genome itself. In fact, it might even be the most evolvable region. So seeing a, a, an insertion here of 12 base pairs pop up in a, in a region of a highly evolvable part of a virus is no surprise at all. And again, I think it's the one that poised it to become the pandemic pathogen that it is today. The furin cleavage site might have had a lot to do with that. So again, it's not unique. It's not surprising. And in fact, these are common features of these kinds of viruses. So if we look at the virus itself, let's just uh, take a look at the coronaviruses in general. Well, coronaviruses are a common thing in humans. It's a common virus that Come, it spills over multiple times. Here's just nine examples of, of, of coronaviruses we know about, two of which have occurred during the pandemic. Most of these are alpha and betas, and you know that there are some of them like 229E and HKU1, for example, are beta coronaviruses. The same for SARS-1 and SARS-2, also beta coronaviruses. So they really emerge in the human population with regular frequency. Now, SARS-1 and SARS-2, we notice them as soon as they emerge because they're very severe. Many of the others, like HKU1, for example, we noticed it in 2005, but actually realized that it's a much older virus that have been circulating in, in the human population for decades. What's important too is that if we look at these subeco viruses, the SARS-like coronaviruses, is that they're all across Southeast Asia. They're very abundant and very importantly, they're extremely undersampled. Here's an example from a recent paper here showing just the number of viruses that are highly related to SARS-CoV-2, of which there are many, found primarily in horseshoe bats, but also in pangolins. And I'll say the pangolin link is pretty interesting because it's not clear if they are accidental hosts or whether they might actually serve as reservoirs. I'll say I'm more and more leaving towards the, the latter where they might actually be reservoirs and not just accidental hosts. What's not shown here, the banal viruses that were recently identified in Laos, and in fact, the banal viruses are the most closely related to SARS-2 itself. So I mentioned the horseshoe bat, and this is something, again, where there's a lot of confusion or direct misinformation, is that horseshoe bats are, in fact, extremely widespread across all of Southeast Asia, including in places like Hubei, where Wuhan is, of course. And in fact, Hubei itself has many cave systems, and they're full of bats, including horseshoe bats. So the viruses, the, the, the reservoirs are there, so of course the viruses can also be there. Now, we might not have sampled very close relatives of SARS-2 in a place like Hubei, for example, but that doesn't mean that it's not there because our ability to sample is massively undersampled um, compared to the true diversity out there. So let's just do a couple of comparisons here. Here's SARS-1 and a couple of key features of that. Beta coronaviruses, receptors, the ACE2, lives in bats, the intermediate hosts we know about for that particular epidemic with civets and raccoon dogs being the primary ones involved. The range of this virus like SARS-2 is wide, meaning it is capable of infecting a large number of different animals, including humans. The timing of that, and pay note to that, is November 2002. That's when that jumped. This time in Guangdong, China, in association with wet markets and restaurants. The introduction, the number of introductions into human population was multiple. It's not just something that happened once and then it took off in the human population. In fact, this is something that happened several times. And importantly, that's directly linked to the fact that initially the response from China was none. First of all, they were covering up, meaning they did not notify anybody that they actually had cases until the case popped up in Hong Kong in 2000, early 2003. But importantly, too, things like the wet markets, restaurants, and wildlife trading continue post their first introductions. That's not true for SARS-2. Now, I have just marked Yunnan here because there's this common misbelief that 
SARS-2 must have come from Yunnan because we believe that maybe SARS-1 did come from there, but that's just not true. Again, it's a very oversampled place and there might simply be the reason why we see the locations. Importantly too, there's been this confusion about like, well, Hubei is really far from Yunnan, so how can the virus make its way over there? Well, wildlife trade, right? The same happened in Guangdong. Guangdong is about as far away from Yunnan as Hubei is. In fact, let me just show you that. There is Guangdong and there's Hubei. So if we compare these two viruses, again, look at the similarities here, right? It's a very, very similar viruses, same receptor, same reservoir. We don't know about the intermediate host. This is really important, right? That we have not identified yet. Now, the timing, that's the same. November 2002, November 2019. And what's interesting here, I will say this is something we're look, actively looking into, but, but there are reports saying that actually bat populations, for example, have much higher positivity of better coronaviruses post the summer when you have new bats being born, apparently. So the question is, is there something about the timing here which could quite directly be tied to that? I don't know. It's, it's two simple examples here, right? But it's plausible, I would say. The association is the same, it's a wet market, and in the introductions, I'm going to look into, go into that a little bit more detail, is that it could have been one, could have been multiple, we don't actually know. Um, the response, though, compared to SARS-1 SARS was very fast, meaning that the wet market was shut down, other wet markets were, were shut down, and the wildlife trade was also shut down, and in fact, is shut down to this day. So let's just go into the animals here because the animals are important when we talk about these emergence. And the two usual suspects we're talking about are raccoon dogs on one side and civet cats on the other side. When it comes to SARS-1, civets are believed to be the primary source of the epidemic, but I will say that raccoon dogs also are very likely source here. And in fact, both of these animals as well as ferrets were found to be positive um, for SARS-1. But well, here's what's interesting, because in my world, I thought we had sorted out SARS. I thought what we knew would happen. It came from bats in Yunnan, and then via wildlife trade, it got into Guangdong, and then it hopped into human population. We've completely missed this fact that, well, actually, positive civets were not just identified in Guangdong, they were identified in Hubei too, which is, of course, where Wuhan is. And what's really important with these civets is that not only were they positive, but the SARS-1 that we find is actually very closely related to the human cases, including having three out of four mutations that are believed to be important for human-to-human -human transmission. That's not true of the other market animals from Guangdong, for example, where infected animals, civets and raccoon dogs were identified. They are much further away genetic distance than the, the, the Hubei civet, civet cats. So this asks this very interesting question saying, well, for SARS-1, we found it in two provinces in China, Hubei and Guangdong. Is it actually possible that Hubei could have been the source of SARS-1 as well as the, 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 the source of SARS-2. I don't know the answer to that, but I'll say it's certainly a plausible hypothesis looking at this particular data, which again, most people have missed and I certainly missed it. And it's something that we're looking into really closely right now. But the problem is that when I'm talking about, about animals though, is that if you read the WHO report, they told you that there were no animals. Well, there were animals like shrimp and fish because it was a seafood market. But wild mammals like raccoon dogs and civet cats were not sold at the Huanan seafood market. So there's a missing link there and saying, that, well, if you think it comes from animals, but they're not actually at the market, then how, how, how does that work? And that's a good question. Well, but that got answered because it turns out that that's not actually true. Not only were there animals at the Huanan seafood markets, wild mammals, it's the type of animals that we know are highly susceptible to SARS-2 and SARS-1. Things like raccoon dogs, things like civets, mink, fox, deer, badgers. We know some of these, like raccoon dog, mink, fox, and deer, we know that they can be infected by SARS-2. In fact, we have seen white-tailed deer in the United States are extremely widespread SARS-2 infections. So we know the, in fact, the animals that are susceptible were in fact sold at the Huanan seafood market and importantly across at least three other markets and very importantly they come in via common supply chains they're all all shared 
And what's important to understand about the wildlife farming is that it's a huge business, or was, because again, it's closed down now, but it's a huge business in China, more than $50 billion annual industry with tens of millions of people employed. It's a poverty alleviation project. Very, very successful. This is a way to bring people out of poverty. And now we have SARS-1 and potentially SARS-2 being directly tied to that particular trade. So it's not such a surprise, first of all, that a country like China might be a little obfuscating on early details, right? But it's certainly not uh, a surprise when it comes specifically to the animals, which we know is true because, again, the official statement to the WHO was that there were no such animals sold. But again, as I mentioned, is that we know that's just not true. Importantly, too, is that if we look at that market itself, well, we found the virus there, right? And not only did we find the virus, we actually also isolated it. So it was possible there's enough virus there to grow out in tissue culture. Now, they did not come from infected animals because, remember, the infected animals were not supposed to be there. These are from actual environmental samples. So the link here is clear, but let's just take a look at the cases too, because this is really important. And in fact, Mike Warabi just published a paper just a couple of hours ago here in Science, which looked at the early cases and early hospitalizations. If you look at this map here, where you have the Huanan seafood market is located over here, north of the Yangtze River, and then you have uh, one institute, one institute all, you one campus there, another campus there. What you can see is that if you look at all the early cases, this is in December, all of these cluster really closely around the Huanan seafood market and nowhere else. And in fact, the earliest association, the, the realization that there's an outbreak here was actually made at the hospitals. The hospitals noticed that, wait, we have a lot of patients with pneumonias and they all trace back to the Huanan seafood market or Many of them, I should say, because not all of them, but the majority did. So the clustering around the seafood market here really is very, very strong, despite what some might make you to believe. And importantly, there's nothing else that clusters around. There's no clustering around the Wuhan Institute of Virology where they did BSL 2 and 3 work on coronaviruses, right? It's around the seafood market. Importantly, too, is the same can actually be said about the early excess deaths. So now we're into January here. But when we're looking about the early excess deaths, well, it's right where you have the Huanan seafood market. So if you are afraid of some sort of bias in the early cases, while you have the hospitalizations, that there is no bias. And in fact, there isn't in the early cases either. But let's just say that you wanted to make that argument. Well, the early excess deaths cluster in the same way. So we have a very, very clear association with the market and the early cases. The other thing we have, and I mentioned this, is that we have these two early lineages really early on in the pandemic. We have lineage A and we have lineage B. Now, what's unclear, well, there's several questions around that, but what's unclear is that, well, is this because of two spillovers into the human population, or is because of one, where one then evolved into the other? And we don't know. I'll say it's unclear at this point. What's important, though, is that lineage B is what we find at the Huanan seafood market. That's what gets sampled from there. I should point out, though, that it does not mean that lineage A wasn't there, right? Because there's biases in samples, and you don't have that many genomes, and there's A could, in fact, have been there. So if you conclude that it is not, that's simply false. We just don't know. Lineage A was associated not with the Hunan seafood market. There's reports about other markets uh, across the city. But what that really means, we don't, we don't really know. Largely, this was associated with cases outside the market. Now, this matters because if, of course, you have two multiple introductions or two independent introductions of the virus into the human population, associated with different markets is obviously completely inconsistent with any version of the lab leak. Um, but importantly, again, as I'm saying, the data doesn't prove that at this stage. But what's important to understand here is that there's a lot of uncertainty. So if you conclude that, for example, lineage A must be the root of the tree, and it was not associated with the Huanan seafood market, hence it could not have started at the Huanan seafood market, and many places have, many people have actually come to that conclusion, that's simply wrong. 
just cannot conclude that based on the available evidence. Importantly, too, trying to understand the timing, it does matter whether you have one or two or multiple introductions into the human population. And I will say this is something we're looking at very, very closely because, of course, it is, it is important to understand. Now, many people seem to believe that two introductions is virtually impossible because we're talking, they think we talk about probabilities here. But what's important to understand is that that's not what it is, right? Because again, the supply chains that share, then the, bio, the, the, the animals are, are spread across the city in different wet markets. So seeing multiple introductions, which is what we saw with SARS-1, is in fact not unusual. And I will say it's the more likely scenario um, that I believe. Now, if we look at the lab leak, though, what evidence do we actually have? And I mentioned this in the beginning is that we don't have any. Now, many have taken that to believe as like, well, but China is not sharing anything, which is true. Certainly today, there is no communication between China and other countries on this particular question. But what's important though here is that the absence of evidence is actually evidence of absence. It doesn't prove the absence, but it is evidence of it, even though that's typically not true. And the reason why I'm saying that is that, well, if this virus must, should, would have had to have been in the Wuhan Institute of Virology prior to the pandemic, it's that, that's where it came from, we would have expected to have some evidence of that. But there is none. Look at sequencing databases. For example, they tended to use to do the same experiments over and over again, but there's no evidence of SARS-2 in any of the databases. In the publications, there's no mentioning of viruses that could have been SARS-2. The intelligence community in the US just concluded a report that took them three months, but they spent a lot longer on it. They didn't find any evidence for lab leak either. All theses from the Wuhan Institute of Virology have been unearthed, and in fact, no evidence of a virus that could have been SARS-2 in there either. As you've all seen, including my own emails, but is there FOIAs and grants and annual reports and emails, there's no SARS-2 in any of those either, right? We can look at culture adaptation, whether that being culture adaptation relaxed or actual gain of function, and there's no evidence of that in SARS-2 genome either. More to come on that as well. Now, I talked about evolutionary inconsistencies in the very beginning, my email to Tony, and I was just wrong. There are, in fact, no evolutionary consistence, inconsistencies, and I would say it was also a little bit of a naive statement from me. But importantly, we looked into it closely, right? And there's nothing inconsistent anywhere. Of course, the VIV itself has reported that they didn't have any cases, and they said they tested by ELISA and PCR, and they denied working with the virus prior to the pandemic. Well, of course, it's fully inconsistent with any version of the lab leak for that institute. You might conclude that they're lying about that, but then you have to ask yourself your question, what's your evidence for that? And in my opinion, there is none. So what's important to understand is that if we're talking about any theory, of SARS-CoV-2 our origin must be able to explain all facts, right? Facts like the early cases, for example. How do you explain that? How do you explain this association with a wet market, which is what we have seen before, if you believe it came out of the lab? Any theory must be able to explain all those facts. So I wanted to acknowledge a number of people here, my fellow, Su, fellow Sunati, as we're sometimes called over here, as well as members of my own lab and many other labs working into this. Um, and I will say a lot of work still going on. Now, Jesse turned on his camera, but I'm not done yet. I like to do this sometimes, especially because it was Jesse. Because I, I want to go back. I'm surprised, I think. All right, keep, keep going. <laughs> I want to go back to this particular <laughs> point which is that any theory of SARS-2 origin must be able to explain all the facts. Because this is important. Because what facts would actually convince you, listening to me or seeing this, would convince you of either theory. Now, the lab leak is simple. Any evidence of the virus at the lab prior to the pandemic, that essentially proves a lab leak. But what about the other one, the natural emergence? Well, maybe infected animals at the market would do it. So let me just actually take you back to that market again, because I showed you this. This is from the WHO report. It's the map from the WHO report. And there's a lot of details on there. It's pretty confusing. But we also have the original China CDC report, which was leaked in June of last year. There's a lot of details in there, including where did they sample from? 
how many times did the samples, which ones of those were positive, is all in this report. So we can add in those details on top of the map I just showed you, and we can even link it back up to what's on GISAID in terms of genomes, and you have a lot more information all of a sudden. But now it's more confusing. So let me just take all of that away from you again. And now you're just looking at the stalls, the west side and the east side, right? Two places where you have um, at the Wunan seafood market. And now let me add back in just the positives, environmental samples here, and the number of environmental samples positive at a certain location. Now it starts to be a little clearer. And now let me just add on top of that, where did they actually sell wild animals like raccoon dogs? Well, the southeast corner. Sorry, southwest corner, importantly. And if I then put a kernel density on top of that and saying like, what's the clustering of these particular positive environmental samples? Well, there it is, right where they're selling the wild animals like raccoon dogs. So when you're being told that there is no clustering inside the market, it's simply not true. It's because people have not looked closely enough or because the WHO report did not look at this question closely enough, very importantly. But there's actually more to this. So some of you might know Eddie Holmes, good colleague and friend of mine, is that, you know what, that particular shop, which had these five positives in there, Eddie went there in 2014 to that very shop in 2014. And he took photos from that shop. Here's Eddie fo Eddie's photos of the shop itself, raccoon dogs, raccoon dogs there, for example. But now if we just zoom in on what are the positive samples, where did they actually get those environmental samples from, from that particular shop, is that, well, the two positive samples from tow trucks. Well, try and zoom in on that photo a little bit, and there they are. This is 2014, so probably not the same ones, right? But here are two examples of these cuts of tow trucks. And importantly, these are the ones that are being used to transport around animals like these mobile cages of a raccoon dog, also taken from that shop. So they were positive. Then there's an iron cage that was also positive. And here you have the iron cage that Eddie took a photo of with raccoon dogs in it. So was that the same cage? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, but it's from that shop. Then there's the feather remover, which was confusing to me because why is a feather remover positive? Well, of course you do have positive environmental samples from humans, they do carry it around. There's a ground sample here, for example, which could very likely have been from a human. But the feather remover was interesting because when I raised this with Eddie, he said, well, look at my photo. What do you find underneath the raccoon dogs? You find birds the raccoon dogs were sitting on top of birds. In fact, this is why Eddie took that photo, because you had raccoon dogs sitting on top of birds, and now you have a positive feather remover from that very shop. So if you take all of that, and there's much more evidence like the clustering outside the market, is that what do you think best explains all of this? The clustering inside, the clustering outside, the type of samples that are actually positive. And it's because I come back to this again, which is that any theory of SARS-CoV-2 origin must be able to explain all facts. If you know something is to be a fact, well, you have to be able to explain it satisfactorily. In the China CDC report itself, what they concluded was, in summary, it is highly suspected that a current epidemic is related to the trade of wild animals, which is because they noticed this clustering outside the market as well as outside the market. It's just that largely this has been forgotten or it hasn't really been communicated. So with that, I just wanted to leave you with this last slide on the Umbrella Man, which I recommend you look up if you haven't already seen this short documentary from the New York Times, because I think it's a really good example of exactly the kind of thing that we are dealing with that. So with that, I will stop my sharing and then we can get to some questions. All right, I, I now will safely turn on my video. Sorry about that false, yeah, sorry about that. false alarm, false ending. Uh, but I'm glad, I'm glad we heard the end. Um, so thank you, Christian. Uh, uh, very um, uh, thought provoking uh, talk. Uh, 
I'm waiting for some questions in the in the chat. Uh, I really enjoyed that last part. It was some real John Snow uh, epidemiology, you know, going back to uh, clustering around the, the Broad Street pump. Um, yeah, super compelling. So I'm yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll say, let me just put one, because I do think that's important, right? Because there's been a lot of focus on individual cases. Where did they come from? Where all these things, which, which is important, right? But there's no question we missed patient zero. And in fact, there might be multiple patient zeros, right? But the clustering, when you look at it population level, is really important because it tells you something that individual cases cannot, which is exactly what John Snow did. It's the same thing. Where is it that people are dying? Triangulated that to, well, there's a pump in the middle of it. So it's probably coming from there, which of course was correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and, and coming back, I mean, this is, um, I guess, something of a, a comment merged with the question, but, but just to, to highlight something you said about um, how, you know, people say, oh, that two independent origins, so to speak, or these two clades, oh, that's too unlikely. But you're saying, you know, actually, maybe that wouldn't be unlikely if actually we're talking about not a single introduction or that th those two are totally independent. It's that they're not independent, they're dependent. No. And if you have a, uh, a host reservoir that is like, it, 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 imagine if you sample two people today um, from the city of Montreal or San Diego, uh, even if it's all Delta, they would probably be separated by, you know, two, three, four, five mutations. And right. if you took those people and put them in a cage and then sent them somewhere else to start an epidemic, then you, you know, you have diversity. So, yeah. yeah and I think, you know, uh, Joel, my colleague, Joel Wertheim in San Diego made a really good analogy earlier this morning where he said that, well, Mount Everest was on, on climb for 100,000 years. And then it was climbed in a day by two people, right? Because they are not, you're dealing with a lot of statistical non-independence here, right? That once it happens once, well, it actually becomes more likely, and we will have a study on this, but it actually becomes more likely that it happens more than once, right? Because, there are, and, and again, it's because they're not independent, right? It's not that it's so, the whole like really, you know, unlikely events happened upstream of the virus making its way into animals and then ending up in the human food, food chain and having a furin cleavage site, for example. Those are the things that are hugely unlikely. But once all of those come together and they do end up in the human food chain, the downstream events become much more likely. And in fact, a single virus just hitting one human and then taking off in a pandemic, that's pretty unlikely. Mm -hmm. right? it's much more likely that it tries multiple times and some of them become successful and takes off and most of them do not. Mm -hmm. We showed, my own group showed exactly the same thing with Zika, for example, when that got into the United States, exactly the same picture. Um, Mark, did you, did you have a question or um, I just saw Mark pop up. Are, are there any questions in the chat? I haven't seen any. Uh, none yet. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going uh, for a couple minutes anyway. Um, we're, uh, I think we still have a couple minutes. Um, so I guess uh, my next question is, you know, when this happens next time, uh, is it going to be the same predicament or are we, you know, are we getting the same kind of uncertainties and debates or, you know, what can we do? Is there anything we can do uh, so that th this will be easier next yeah. time, you know? I mean... <laughs> is, that po is that possible? I don't know. I, 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 think, I think the really key point here is that work together, right, and focus on the evidence. I mean, if you look at the whole... I mean, the lab leak is by far the most popular opinion right now. That's how it happened. Mm -hmm. But you winnow down saying, yeah, but what's the evidence for that? There is none. Right. It's innuendo, it's speculation, and of course requires a cover up lying from Chinese scientists. Right. That's not, you know, because the, if, if this were to happen tomorrow, for example, in Wuhan again, or in Guangdong or somewhere else in China, do you think we're going to deal with this faster than we did with this particular time? No. 
And the problem is that if you look at things like the banal viruses, for example, that are very similar to SARS-2, and in fact can infect human cells as well, if not better, when we're talking about the pangolin coronaviruses, human cells, is that there's tons of viruses that are poised for emergence in the human population. And now the problem is that we have created this environment that has become politicized and toxic that nobody wants to work together. And overall, that makes it way more likely that we won't be able to deal with this as effectively as we did with this one. But of course, even though it was fast this time around, it was insufficient, right? Because SARS-2 still took over the world. So I think from that perspective, I think the whole conversation around this understanding that, look, this takes time. It's not just that we can go out and find answers tomorrow and you can't find it in grant reports, right? Is that overall makes us much less prepared to actually deal with the reality that we are finding, which is that we have a lot of these viruses poised for emergence. Yeah, I agree. Not 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 an optimistic view, but uh, but uh, I think that's what we're up against. Uh, I th- well, I got one question, and then um, I, I I think we're up at our time. Um, it's from uh, Pierre Olivier Curion, uh, who asks any thoughts about the American deer infections and the possibility of creating a local reservoir, so into humans and back into other yeah. animals. Yeah, I mean. But- I, I've, I've talked about this for a long time. And in fact, because the whole mink stuff that happened in Denmark, which is where I'm from, that was exactly my concern. I say that, look, establishing reservoirs of this virus outside the human population is not good for multiple different reasons. Um, we're way past that already. There are reservoirs like in the deer population, for example, and I'm sure there are many other reservoirs that we simply just have, have not nailed down yet. And that's the reality that we are, we are living in. And this is also why it's so important that we are well past the, the point of being able to eliminate this virus, right? It's with us forever now. Um, and that's really unfortunate. I will say from my perspective, I don't think that we necessarily had to end up in, in the current situation with that being the case, but it is now the case and it is what we need, need to deal with. Of course, by far the most you know, important reservoir still is the human population. There is a huge number of infections daily and has been for two years now. Um, But I think there's little doubt that it will establish additional reservoirs outside the human population. It's just too much of a generalist virus. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I can take one more question from Mark, but it's really up to Mark because it's going to cut into his own closing remarks. So um, I'll, I will leave it up to Mark. Well, uh, I, I, actually, I was going to ask the same question about the reservoirs and the transmission from humans to other animals, but right. you answered that. We could obviously go on for many for for a long time discussing many interesting things with you. So uh, I think we'll call it quits there. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Jesse. Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you very much, Charles, for uh, for this session. Great. Uh, yeah, so with that, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Christian. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Charles, I think, has logged off. Great session. Um, thanks for the talks and the discussion.